going to be looking at the first several verses. And actually, I took chapter 11 and I divided it into two portions. And so we'll be looking at part one, chapter 11 today. We're looking at the elect of Israel. And so we'll begin at verse one in <laughs> Romans 11. I'll read verses one through six and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse one, reading to verse six. Paul writes, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars. I alone am left and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. And so Paul has been presenting Israel from two standpoints, from the standpoint of God and uh, from Israel's own standpoint. Now, in chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, he had written that God sovereignly chose his children. He had said there, it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. And so he's speaking of how God has chosen his people. And he had said in chapter 10 that, that Israel stubbornly refused to respond to God. And as we looked at chapter 10, he had said at verse 21, the last verse of the chapter, he said to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So they have consistently been disobedient. They have consistently resisted him. I mentioned to you out of Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, how Jesus had said this. He had said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he had already pointed out that the nation of Israel has stubbornly refused, stubbornly rejected him and the sending of Messiah. So as he's been sharing that in chapter 10, he begins in verse 1 here by actually answering a question. In verse 1, it reads, I say then, has God cast away his people? The question would be, has, you know, has God cast away the people? But he answers and says, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So will Israel's stubbornness result in their never being saved, the Jews not being rescued by God? Well, will God ultimately and forever reject Israel? Now, seeing that Israel has rejected Messiah, what will become of them is what he's dealing with. What will become of them as a people? Now, Paul had already prepared his readers for this section in chapter 9, verses 27 through 29, when he said that God has a remnant. So in this portion of Scripture, he's clarifying what he's referred to earlier. So he begins in verse 1 again with the question, did God cast away his people? So we're going to see in a moment that the answer to that question is no. In Jeremiah 46, verse 28, it reads, Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, I'm with you declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. But he said, I will not completely destroy you. Now, when we're speaking about Israel, and I'm refreshing your memory for a moment, in chapter 9, he had said in verse 6, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. 
That's because Israel is not simply natural descent, but spiritual. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, we read, Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Don't think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. It's not the natural descent. It's not that you can point back, he is saying, and say that we all are from Abraham's seed, Israel being um, the children, we'll say, of Abraham. So he had already pointed out to be recognized as children of Abraham actually requires faith. He had, he had already said that in chapter 4 when he said in verse 9, we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And so it, it's not physical descent. Not every physical individual who claims that they have a kinship to God through Abraham is really Israel. Israel is actually made up of those, you know, there is a spiritual quotient, we'll put it that way. There are Jews, and then there are those who are real descendants of Abraham by the basis of faith. And that's the point he's making right now, and I'll develop that with you as we go through this. So he's speaking of himself in this way, and he's saying that in reality... I'm an example. He's saying, I'm an example of what would be called a Christian Jew. I'm both Jewish and Christian. And that reveals that such a person actually exists. When you go to Israel, I've said this before, I'll say it briefly. Um, at least the last time I remember checking on this, maybe it's changed since then. But if you were uh, of a Jewish heritage, if you... You were Jewish ethnicity. You took a DNA test, and and you know you're you're a Jewish person. Um, you could apply for citizenship in Israel based on the fact that you have Jewish DNA, and they would accept you. But if you're a Christian who is also of Jewish descent, and you claim to be a Christian, they would say you cannot uh, receive citizenship here. Because you're not Jewish. They would say, you're a Christian. Which in their mind, and this is recent, it may still be. In their mind, you stopped being Jewish when you became a believer in Messiah. And that, that, that's a fact. I mean, that, that's what, what's been going on for, for quite some time. But Paul is saying, no, no, God has not cast away his people. I'm an example of a Jew who's a believer in Messiah. That's a point he's making. Now, remember in Ephesians 2, in verses 11 through 13, Paul had said, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so it's the blood of Christ that brings you into the family of God. So he said to the Galatians in chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so that's what we call a spiritual kinship to the nation of Israel. And so, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. So he goes on, he says, God, in verse 2, has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, I alone am left, they seek my life. But what does the divine uh, response say to him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So has God forsaken his people once again? No. Now, notice this, and I'll develop this for a moment. He uses the example of a prophet in the, in the Old Testament. All of us know his name, Elijah. Elijah is spoken of in 1 Kings chapter 17 in the Old Testament up until chapter 2 of 2 Kings. 
And Paul is referring to scripture found in chapters 18 and 19. To illustrate this, he's utilizing the prophet. You see, in chapter 18, scripture records an encounter on Mount Carmel. It was in this place that Elijah exposed Israel's false prophets. Uh, some of you have been to this place and you've stood there overlooking the valley of Megiddo and all, and you've received Bible studies there. Um, this will refresh your memory. Um, what he was doing is he was making a challenge to the false prophets, those who represented the God, quote-unquote, Baal, as well as Asherah. And he wanted to reveal to Israel their true God. So there were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, and they were gathered together. And so there was a challenge given. There were going to be two bulls that were to be cut in pieces, placed on wood, but there would be no fire placed under the wood. Now, the prophets, the false prophets, would take one bull, and they did, and they slaughtered it, they butchered it, they placed it on the wood. And, and the Bible says that from morning until noon, they cried out, and they leaped about the altar. But in spite of all of their efforts, the Bible makes it clear there was no answer. So in 1 Kings 18, 27 through 29, it says, so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's meditating, he's busy, he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping, he must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention which is a picture of worshiping idols, worshiping false gods. All their efforts, all their screaming, all their dancing around, all the bloodletting availed in no way. And so they're being mocked by the true prophet. So Elijah calls the people to himself. He takes 12 stones. They had a, an altar that had been broken, so they repair that broken altar. He dug a trench. He filled it with 12 large water pots of water, and then he prayed. And the prayer was a simple prayer. He wasn't bouncing around. He wasn't slashing himself. He wasn't doing anything. He simply said in 1 Kings 18, 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. What was the answer? God answered by fire. He consumed the offering as well as drying up all the water because they had poured all this water in order to ensure that if something happened, it would have to be a miracle. And when this happened, the people cried out, the Lord, he's God. And so he took the false prophets, and according to the law of Moses, he executed them. Now, after this, he was chased by the patroness of the false prophet, Jezebel. I have two daughters. I didn't name either one of them Jezebel. I dated a few, but I never, <laughs> never <laughs> named my child that. I mean, Jezebel is like naming your son Judas. That's not a name that you give to your child. And so Jezebel comes after him. Again, we know the story. And he fled from before Jezebel, and he went out and he hid in the wilderness. He sat under the branches of a juniper tree, and he, and he prayed. And this is what he basically said. He said, God, just take my life. And as he was moaning to the Lord, God sent an angel to minister to him. He fed him, and he sent him on a journey. And he made his way all the way to a place called Mount Horeb, which, would, which the Scripture says took him 40 days. That was actually an unusually long time to take a 200-mile journey uh, there's no explanation as to why it took so long, but it took a long time for him to get there. And finally, when he arrived, he went into a cave. And it was in a cave that the Lord came and spoke to him. In 1 Kings 19, verse 9, he asked him, well, what are you doing here, <laughs> Elijah? Now, he's discouraged. He's physically and spiritually exhausted. And so he replies in verse 10 of 1 Kings 19, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, 
The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. What are you so discouraged? Well, some minor problems. They're trying to kill me. That, uh, that causes me some concern. But God said, go stand on a mountain, and, and then he passed by. A strong wind tore into the mountain, broke the rock. After the wind came, a strong earthquake. And after the earthquake, earthquake came, a fire. Earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> I believe that's where that group got the name. Seriously. Earth, wind, and fire. And so this is what took place. Now, the scripture says the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And the Lord was not in the fire. In 1 Kings 19.12, it simply says, After the fire, the Lord spoke, and he was a still, small voice. A still, small voice. Earth, wind, and fire. Earthquake, windstorm, and fire. A still, small voice. What are you saying? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. A still, small voice. Keep that in mind next time you're going through your own earth, wind, and fire experience. Keep that in mind. Because he wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the windstorm, and he wasn't in the fire. He spoke in a still, calm voice to remind him that he was in control. He didn't have to do something so extreme. He simply needed to bring comfort into a broken prophet. You see, he's saying to him, and we'll get back to the passage, but he was saying, I will accomplish this work. You're not alone. You see, he thought he was alone. But God says, no, you're not alone. I have reserved for myself 7,000 men. You know, church, today we can feel that we are alone and we have no allies. We can think in, 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 <laughs> in, in truth, the world is against us. And the onslaught against the faith of, of the Christian is huge. I mean, even uh, when there have been disasters of some sort and Samaritan's Purse wants to be on the scene to help, and the people of New York say, we don't want your help. It's a real obvious thing that there's a, a, a war against the faith of Christ. There's no doubt about it. And sometimes we can begin to be very, very um, discouraged, and we can think, we have no chance that we're going to be overwhelmed completely. Nobody else wants to be saved. Young people don't care about the gospel. That's a lie from Satan. That's a lie from the pit. That's not true at all. There are still people who are faithful to God. There are still Christians who are serving the Lord with all of their heart. There are still churches that are built on the faith of Christ, proclaiming the gospel. It's still happening. And we need to remember that. And God is going to do that work, and he has a way of doing it. We're not alone. God says, I will accomplish that work. And so he's pointing out that he's the one who does the work. And so in context, back to Romans 11, God has set a people apart for himself. He's saying, even as God had 7,000 who had not bowed their knee to this false God, he was saying, there are Jews that are reserved to be used by God also. And so he's pointing that out. Notice verse 5. Even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. When he speaks of the election of grace, there are those he's saying are the remnant who are saved, not because they hold fast to an attempt to observe the law and the commandments. They are saved because they are yielded to God through the grace of God and faith in Christ. In 2 Timothy 1.9, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So he says, they are saved by God's grace. And then he says in verse 6, if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So the preservation of the remnant cannot be a work uh, of, of grace and, and, and works themselves because he said work is no longer work. And in, in other words, attempting to obey 
uh, something uh, that should actually uh, be done through the grace of God. You, you cannot, in other words, be saved by your efforts. It's all going to be always by the grace of God. And so grace is what we trust in. I, I made a note to myself. I'll say it very, very briefly because I ain't going to get through this. And we're going to have communions. So I'm going to relax a moment and I'll stop where I stop so we can have communion. <sighs> I wanted to share this, but here, this is important for you. I want, I, I'm going to point it to you and take just a moment. Um, verse 6, again, if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer works. There's a scripture, quote, unquote. It's not really what we would call a scripture, but it's referred to by those who are proponents of Mormonism. There is a scripture, quote, unquote, that they quote. And this is basically what they say. <laughs> um, they say we are saved by grace after that we have done all that we can do. For those who want to check that, that's Second Nephi chapter 25, verse 23. That's in the Book of Mormon. Um, we are saved by grace after that, we sh after that we when we have done all that we are able to do, all that we can do. Well, that's an example of trying to replace grace with law. What they're saying is that God's grace begins at the point of your efforts rather than in spite of your efforts. I am saved by faith and God's grace plus nothing else. It is by grace that you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works lest any man should boast. If I could perform works that would, that would give me a relationship with God, then Christ has died in vain. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, Christ has died in vain. He said that in Galatians chapter 2. And so, you are saved by the grace of God through faith. And Paul's making that point. He's saying these people, this remnant are not saved because they've kept the law of Moses. No, God has set apart a people for himself who actually have faith in Messiah. And that faith in Messiah at that time, remember this, that the early church was all Jewish. And Jesus, when he, when he said, you're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, it, it, you're going to receive it and you're going to be witnesses to me. He said, where? He said, in Jerusalem and Judea then to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So the grace of God is expressed to the nation of Israel first. So when, when Paul, in chapter 1, he was speaking, he made it very clear. He said, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And when Paul got saved, where is it that he would go first when he entered into a town? Look at the book of Acts. We're going through it right now. Where would he go? He would go first to the synagogues to speak to the Jewish people. So... The grace of God was demonstrated through Messiah who died on a cross for us. Both Jew and Gentile come to relationship with God in the same way. Abraham had faith. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. You and I have faith in Christ and it is accounted to us as righteousness. And so we are children of Abraham, not by physical descent. We are children of, of Abraham by having the faith of Abraham. And that's what Paul's speaking about. So has God stopped working with the nation of Israel? And there are those who would say, yes, that is called replacement theology. I'm not going to give you a big thing on that. But they say that the church replaced Israel. That's not what scripture says, and that's not what Paul is saying here. Has God forsaken the Jews? No. God is continuing to work with them. And so... He says in verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it's written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. David says, let the table become a snare and a trap 
a stumbling block and a recompense to them. I don't remember saying that, but I guess I did. <laughs> Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. And so the non-believing Jews he have been seeking by law, he's saying, what God has given by grace. Now, in chapter 10, verse 3, he had said, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What's the result? He says hard, hardness of heart. The word hardness speaks about a stiffening, a callousing, a callousness. It's a mental callousness. So a hardness. Um, national, national Israel, he's saying, has become hardened against Christ. That was true then. It, it is true to this day. In verse 8, he said, God gave them a spirit of stupor and blind eyes. The word stupor uh, means that they are, they're numb. Blindness is obvious. Uh, they may have seen the wonders of God, but they're spiritually blind. They're refusing to believe. God gave them prophets. And God gave wonders. But they refused him. They've grown dull is what he's saying. They, they not only don't believe, but they refuse to believe because they're spiritually blind. When he says in verses 9 and 10 that David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, that table represents safety and feasting. So may their table become a trap. In other words, as they eat of the law, may they be judged by it. Have they stumbled, verse 11, that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their, their fullness? And so, have they stumbled to never recover? Will they forever be rejected? And the answer is no. There is a purpose in this. This is interesting because he's saying that God is using non-Jews. God is using Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Their fall has actually resulted in riches for the non-Jew. When we looked at Ephesians in chapter 1, we saw what God has given us in Christ, spiritual blessings such as adoption and acceptance, Redemption and forgiveness. He's given us wisdom and inheritance. He has sealed us with the spirit. He's given us life. He's poured out his grace. He's given us a heavenly citizenship. These are things we found in Ephesians 1. I remember hearing a Jewish man on one occasion say this. I have never met a Christian who's ever made me jealous of anything. And I think what he's saying, there's a a bit of truth to it because what he was saying is they don't live any better lives than the non-believers that I know. And there are quite a number, and we know this, it's not a judgment on people who try and fail, who's going to be perfect other than me, nobody. So, <laughs> but it is true, isn't it? I mean, we all fail, we all stumble. I mean, who's to say that's not true? Of course it's true. We aren't in heaven yet, we're not perfected yet, we still have a long way to go, and that's all to be admitted but it's never to be used as an excuse. Just because I'm not perfect doesn't mean I should continue to live as one who doesn't care to be. I should strive for perfection that I might reach excellence, it's been said. I, I should discipline myself, like Paul said, lest, he said, having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. I, 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 I should live in such a, a way that, that people will see that God is with me and say, whatever it is you have, that's what I want. That's what happened the day I got saved. That's exactly what happened the day I got saved. When I came home and my sister Madeline and I were speaking, and she said, what happened to you? And Madeline, my sister, was four years younger than me, but she knew me very well. She knew the life I was living in, things of that nature. What happened to you? And I told her I gave my heart to Christ. And, and there was such a difference about me, even the day I got saved, that she went to bed that night, and that's when she said, God... Whatever you did for my brother, please do it for me. And are there people in your life that look at you and say, whatever they have, that's what I need. I, wanna, I want that. I want that. You know, the joy 
the contentment, the peace, the, the, the ability to not strive and, and be angry and to be addicted and the other various things that our flesh craves and desires. No, Paul said, you know, God saved the, the Gentile because he's going to use the Gentiles, the believers in Christ, to provoke Israel to jealousy. When they say, God is with you. And there are Jewish people I've known, Marie and I have known, who have been around Christians, our guides in Israel. The, our bus driver, we have a bus driver named Abi, and Abi, Abi loves us for some reason. I don't know why, but the last, I'm serious, I don't know why, but the last time I saw him, he, 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 the last trip, we, he came specially to see us. He's retired from driving his bus, but he came to see us and was in the hotel with us, and, and he looked at us and talked to us and hugged us, and, loved, and he said this to me. He said, you are my family, and that just touched my heart. And then he asked for a loan. But anyway, but I, <laughs> yeah, I am your family. <laughs> but he was a bus driver for Pastor Chuck and so many others. And over the years, he heard the gospel, heard the gospel, and then watched the ministers. He watched the life of Pastor Chuck and the others whom he had gotten to know. And he developed a closeness to them. And then he developed a love for them. And then he developed a love for the Messiah. Because obviously a saved man, Jewish believer. I mentioned Yossi, who was a very dear, very dear friend of ours. And Yossi did the same thing. He watched the Christians. He watched the pastors. He spent time with Pastor Chuck. He listened to the Bible studies. And then one day he finally said, Jesus is the Messiah. There's something in their life that I want. And that's the life I want to live. That's the way I want to live. I don't want people to say, boy, you know, he's a nice guy. I want people to say, I want to worship the God that he worships. Because that's, that's the key, right? Not just being somebody that is liked by others, but somebody who leads the way for others to discover that one who has made them who they are. And so the Jews are intended to see the blessings that God pours out on the church and to say, we have so many promises in the Old Testament, but they've seen the fulfillment. They have what we don't have. And I'm going to stop there because it's time to have communion. I will pick up next week, God willing. But may we be the people that are able to provoke others to a desire for the God that we worship.